Right. Hey guys, thank you. So welcome to my talk. So this is my first time here um, at NordSec, and I'm very proud to be here today, really. Um, this morning we've had an uh, amazing talk. I, uh, I learned a lot of stuff, lots of new things. It was pretty cool. So in my talk today, um, I have something that is pretty cool that I want to show you. Well, at least I hope you'll find it cool too. Um, so basically, this is a project I've been working on uh, on and off for the past year or so. And uh, every time I work on this thing, I keep learning new stuff, new tricks, new ways of doing stuff. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> I have something big that is about to come out, uh, something that is using exactly the technology that I'm describing in my talk today. Uh, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to pull it out for uh, NordSec uh, because I need a couple more months of technical implementation and things like that. So if you follow me, you'll see what I mean. All right, so, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, uh, I'm about to show you guys how to set up a cache timing cover channel so that two virtual machines that are co-located on the same physical box uh, can talk together. Basically, that they can modulate a signal to the last level cache, the L3 cache, um, uh, using, a, using a technique of cache and reload, flash and reload. Uh, the technique I'm going to show you is, is, is a practical implementation. This is not just a proof of concept or theory stuff. It's something that works for real. And when I, when I mean something that works for real, it's something that is felt. Something that, let's say, you have your back door installed in one of the VM. No, no one is, is going to detect it ever because it doesn't, it doesn't take too much CPU resources. It's really stealth. Um, so just one thing to notice before we, we start, for this trick to work, um, your virtual machine have to be co-located on the same physical socket. They can be floating on any core, it doesn't matter as long as they are on the same physical socket. And the reason being that L3 cache is shared across sockets, it doesn't span across multiple socket machines. Um, <clears throat> so. If, if, your, if your virtual machines are co-located on hyper-threaded siblings on the, on the same core, right, there is other trick that you can do to, do to modulate the signal across the two VMs. For instance, here in this picture, you can use the, the L2 cache. Uh, <clears throat> you can also use the L1 cache, or you can use the CPU resources that are shared across, across the two hyper-threaded siblings. And actually, this is, um, this is uh, my first example I'm about to show you guys. All right. Okay, so before we begin, um, <clears throat> usual disclaimer. So research, this is a research thing on my own time, on my own network. Uh, this talk is, reflects my opinion, not the one from my employer. Um, information, code, and things like that, it's for educational purpose only, all right? So, uh, yeah. All right, so let me introduce myself uh, and also give you some context of how I ended up working on that project in the first place. So my name is Etienne Martineau. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. I work as a Linux kernel engineer for Cisco System. Uh, when I was a kid, I was really fascinated by radio and electronics and the concept of modulation and things like that. Uh, only much later, during my electrical engineering study, I finally understand what was going on. But then, after school, I ended up, uh, I got a job, ended up working on, on the Linux kernel, hacking around and things like that. So I totally forgot about this modulation thing up until uh, very recently, about a year and a half ago, where uh, part of my work, I was doing some low-level performance analysis on, on, on KVM. I noticed something strange once in a while. I basically, I saw some sort of crosstalk going on between two VMs. So... I dig deeper into the, that problem back then, and I realized that I, the, 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 the problem I was observing was only manifested uh, when the two VMs were co-located on the same physical core, but two different hyper-trading pair. So, um, so then I, I did some more research, and I found that nice picture from Intel. Uh, so basically, this thing is showing that some operation, when you are running with hyper-trading enabled, some operation, instead of running in parallel, they have to be serialized one after the other. Uh, so that's, that's the picture that is showing that. And um, so, so that explained the result uh, I had. But then, 
Then at that time, that, that was exactly at that time I, and I got at that idea. I said to myself, well, what if from VM number one, let's say, um, I modulate a contention pattern over the execution pipeline. Let's say a long instruction multiply is a one, a short instruction is a zero, all right? And now what if on the other VM, I try to detect that, that contention over the execution pipeline. So by measuring the time it takes to execute a certain instruction. If it takes long, well, it's a one. If it's fast, then it's a zero. So <clears throat> this is exactly at that time that I realized that it should be possible to, to kind of modulate a signal across two VM using this, this contention pattern tricks. And to be honest, at that point, I was caught. So. <clears throat> I ended up spending quite, uh, quite a few nights actually playing around with this thing, this pipeline contention, uh, the phase lock loop and a bunch of things that comes with it. I was really curious to see the nature of uh, the communication channel. And um, so, so naturally, I decided to try to transmit an image so that I could see the resulting output on the other side, right? Uh, so obviously this, this was not the first image uh, I tried to transmit, uh, but I repeated that exact same uh, experiment for us here uh, at NordSec. Uh, so this image is a 640, 480 VGA quality, one bit per pixel thing. Um, and, then, and then when I send that image to the other VM, uh, this is the result I got. So it's all blurry. Uh, but uh, we can we can still see some pattern. We can see the the, the, the logo there. But you see that there is lots of noise, and uh, yeah. So basically, at that point in time, way back then, <clears throat> so this is at that time that I realized that there was a big security problem with this whole technology. Because if I can do that, it means that I can probably send data, no problem, right? And um, yeah, by the way, before we move on to the core of my talk, uh, I, I did a video. Basically, I'm, I'm repeating this experiment, but instead of just sending one picture, I'm just streaming them in real time at 15 frames per second, and then we see the effect of what's going on on the system. So let's take a look at the video here. All right, so <clears throat> just before we begin, uh, so on the bottom left, I have what I call my noise generator. Okay, so it's, compile it's a compilation of the Linux kernel on all, this, uh, all the processor. So this is triggering lots of noise, lots of, lots, of, lots, of, lots of crap is going on in the execution pipeline, and you will see the effect on the stream. The other thing I want to mention is uh, I'm, running, I'm running the uh, MP4 encoding software in order to render this video on the same machine than, than I'm doing the experiment. So that thing is Trig is causing lots of noise on its own. If you don't run the encoding software, it's really, more, it's really more clean than that. All right, let's take a look. So the stream is going on real time right now, 15 frames per second. And now I'm starting and stopping the <clears throat> compilation of the Linux kernel. You see that? So remember, this, um, this Streaming technology is using pipeline contention. It does not have anything to do with cache. It's just a pipeline contention that is happening between two hyper-threaded siblings. All right. So let's go back to the talk here. Thank you. OK, so now you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, with this whole thing and design, it's time to, for us to take a step back. Okay, so my goal was to come with a practical implementation, uh, not just some research stuff. Why? Because I wanted to prove that this is a real issue so that we have to fix it. And by the way, I mean, this is VM, right? I'm using virtual machine. Uh, it works on uh, ESX and so on. But uh, con with container, it's even more easy, all right? Uh, we c it's, it's just like... VMs is the most amount of challenge, but container is super easy to do. So in my talk today, we will go over, uh, I'm going to show you all the challenge involved in the design of such a communication channel. Uh, we will go over X86 shared resources. I'm going to show you what they are. And we will go over uh, the fundamental concept be behind the cache line encoding and decoding. Uh, we, have to go, we have to get around the hardware prefetching logic. And I'm not disabling this from the BIOS. Uh, then there is something new that 
that I found rec recently. It's basically the CL flush instruction. There is a way, pretty, pretty nice way to abuse this instruction to, to basically create a bidirectional handshake for free. Uh, then we will look at the persistency of data, the noise that is present on the host, in the guest, in the VM, and so on. And then we will also take a look at the guest to host page table deobfuscation. Sounds complex, but I'll show you what it is. It's not rocket science. At the very end, I'll, I'll show you um, my implementation of phase lock loop and high precision timer. This is the key aspect for that thing to work. We will go over some detection mitigation. I, I've, got, I've got a video at the end of the, the talk, too, that uh, basically describe uh, a reverse shell. You'll see. All right. Let's take a look at those uh, shared resources and, and how they are isolated. So with hyper-threading enabled, like I said at the very beginning, there is lots of possibility for, for modulation. You can do pipeline contention. Uh, this is the first example I show you guys. You can do modulation in L1, modulation in L2. Hyper-threading is typically disabled. Um, uh, in production environment. At the bottom here, there is a link uh, that discussed that way back then in, in, in 2005. And so for that reason, uh, the, you can use the, uh, the last level cache, L3 cache, to do your modulation. So now the problem is, of course, if your VMs are, are being assigned to different socket on large system, well, uh, this whole L3 cache modulation technique isn't going to work. Uh, because the L3 cache is not shared across uh, multiple socket. But then there is the buses that connect all the, the socket together um, in a certain way, and there is the coherency module into that thing. So you can actually do modulation using the coherency module. I've done it. It works. Uh, but that's not my talk today. Uh, I can take question offline after the talk if you want. All right, so now it's time to uh, deep dive about the, um, the, the way we, do, we encode data inside the, the cache. So a cache line is typically 64 byte, okay? So, uh, and, 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 and here the way we, we do it is one bit corresponds to one cache line. So when, uh, when you read a byte that is not in the cache, Let's say you want to read a byte of memory that is not in the cache. Well, it's the whole cache line that is brought in from memory all the way up to the, to the first level cache so that you can read it and get access to it. So here are the basis of cache timing modulation rely on the fact that when, you, when we read memory, we can measure very accurately using the TSC uh, counter the time it takes to read the cache. It's, if it's fast, if it's an L1 survey, well, it's going to be pretty quick. L2 a bit slower, L3 a bit slower, and main RAM way slower. All right? So now the trick to do the encoding is assume, again, one bit is one cache line. So you take a specific cache line, you either load it or flush it. So you load, we assume here it's a one, and you flush, well, you assume it's a, it's a zero, right? And now for the decoding part, what you have to do is you have to access that memory where the cache line belongs to, and then you read it. You read that memory. If it, if it comes back real fast, it means it's a one because it was already loaded. If it's slow, then it's a zero, right? Okay, so I guess it sounds simple, but let's dive into the, uh, the core of it. Um, so, so here, the first thing I have is, is a very simple client and server test program. There is no virtual machine in the picture at that time, okay? It's bare metal running directly on the host. Um, and the cache line that I'm using, they are coming directly from, from shared memory. Okay, uh, so there is no address space to worry about. Shared memory cache line. So the, the client is actually encoding a pattern. That's the pattern that you see at the bottom here. And once the encoding is done, the client just signal on the mutex, the server wakes up, do the decoding. And here, the decoding um, is all messed up, but there, there is a clear uh, pattern in it, but there is something weird going on, okay? So I had to take a step back, and I wrote a simple test program that flushes all the cache line from, let's say, 0 to 100. And, and, and I read them back, and I, I measure the latency. that I, I'm expecting that it should be a long latency for all the cache line. And now you see the result. 
some of those cache lines, they show long latency, 240, 200 plus is long latency. But lots of the other cache line in the picture, uh, they, 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 are all, they are already loaded. So there was something else that was going on in the background here. So uh, this is really at that time uh, that I, had, I learned about prefetching. Okay? So prefetching it means really bringing data or instruction from memory into the cache uh, before they are needed. Uh, the, 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 the system I was using uh, had some, some fancy algorithm for L1 and L2. They are different. But at the end of the day, prefetching means it, it, the guys, the, 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 those algorithms are trying to predict in advance what, what address will be needed in the future. So for the stale operations, during the, 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 the processor just fetch those, those address so that it speed up the execution, hopefully, if the algorithm are, are good. So I just took a picture here. So the hardware prefet prefetcher is one of those things that you can normally disable at the BIOS level. Obviously, this is not what I'm doing here uh, because in, with VMs, we don't have access to the BIOS, and that will be cheating, right? So we have to find a way to, to work around it. So I just you know, experiment a couple of things, and then, and then I, the trick that did it was, was essentially to randomize the cache line access. So I had to do um, the randomization within a page, and all, I also had to do the, the randomization at page level. And when I did that, it just confused the hardware prefetcher entirely. And so then at that time, I got, I got a, a clean picture. So now there is another uh, problem that I face, okay? So what happened if you wait a little bit longer before doing the decoding? Let's say you wait, you wait, and you wait. Well, we clearly see that uh, the, the, the time uh, from when you, you encode the data to the time from when you decode the data has to be very small. Otherwise, uh, the other stuff that is running on the system will pollute the cache and erase your data t totally. So in other words, uh, the encoded data that you put in the cache will evaporate pretty quickly. So this is even more important for us when we are running in VMs. We, because with VMs, there is lots of noise, okay? And believe me, I'm about to show you. So. Um, here I've done a, a couple of experiments, okay? So I'm, basically I'm using a calibrated software loop that takes exactly two um, CPU cycles to execute. And I'm, my tests consist of running that loop 100,000 times. So I'm expecting 200,000 cycles to run that loop, okay? And I'm repeating that test 1,000 times, okay? So now if you are on, on the bare metal inside the kernel with all interruption disabled. This loop is going to take 200,000 cycles over and over and over again because there is nothing that disturbs the loop. There is no one that is running, okay? So now if you are on user, in user space uh, just above the, the kernel on the host directly, there is some noise that is going on and that's expected. Like the small spike that you see there, um, they are the, the timer interruption on a per CPU basis. And the bigger spike, they are actually the network interruption that are coming on CPU zero. Now if we go in the kernel that is running into the VM, and in that kernel, if we disable all the interruption, remember, we won't be able to disable the interruption on the host, but we will only be able to disable the interruption inside the VM, well then there is slightly more noise because there is an hypervisor layer that is sucking out cycle here and there. And finally, if we are in user space inside the VM, you see that there is quite a bit of noise uh, because it comes from, from the, the guest kernel, the, the kernel that is running in the VM, it comes from the kernel and the host, all the interruption, the, the guest kernel has its own sets of interruption, the host has its own sets of interruption, it comes all together, there is the hypervisor and everything. By the way, if you make the math here, it looks pretty bad, but it boils down to a 2% degradation from a, for a compute load. So it's not too bad, but still, there is lots of noise. All right, so now that you understand the noise, we know what it is, you, you know what the hardware prefetcher is, let's go back to our original test program, but this time we put the client and the server in different VM. 
And then I realized that there is another problem. Um, so the cache line that we were using before to do modulation uh, in L2 or in L3, those cache lines are tagged by the physical address. But, but in a VM, uh, the, the physical address that you have had, uh, has nothing to, you cannot see what's going on in the host. Basically, there is another layer of translation. And then you, as this picture is showing, you don't have access to that information. So you don't know what is what from physical point of view. So this is, a, this is a complex problem to solve, to try to, to decipher the, uh, the, the page table from a VM. I don't think it's impossible. I've, I've got a couple of implementation that got it almost, but that's not the, the talk today uh, because we don't actually, with, with KSM, we don't even have to worry about this problem. That's the beauty of it. So what is KSM? So KSM is a feature in the Linux kernel. It's, it's used with KVM. Uh, kernel same page uh, merging. So basically, KSM enabled the kernel on the host to scan running programs and, and compare their memory. Okay? And then if there is a, in that called pages in different programs, KSM detects that condition and merge them together on, on, on just one. Okay? So, if, of course, I mean, if there is a program down the road that wants to modify one of those shared page, KSM will kick in and do the unmerging. So, this feature is pretty useful uh, with virtual machine uh, because, you know, like the guest operating system image can be shared across, across other uh, guest operating system image. So, you end up saving lots of memory. All right, now going back to our test program. So remember, now I have to find shared cache line across two different VMs. So I'm thinking about KSM. All right, so what I decided to do here is each, the client and the server, they create, um, let's say in memory, they, cre they create uh, a, a per page unique pattern that is the same across, client and the, uh, across the client and the server. The idea is that after some time, KSM takes some time before it kicks in to do the merging, KSM will detect those pages and see, oh, those pages are the same. And so KSM will, do the, uh, the, will kick in and it will do the page deduplication for us. So at the end of it, of it, it means that those pages are going to point to the same physical address on the host and so the cache line are shared. One more thing before I go to the next slide, side comment. Uh, with KSM, you can do pretty, pretty cool stuff, such as, let's say, for example, identifying the uh, operating system or the application that are running beside you in the VM. Uh, all you need to do for that, really, is you load into, mem into your home memory the image of what you think is running beside you. You wait a bit, and after that, what you have to do is you basically write to that memory and then you measure the time it takes for the write to go through. If it's uh, slow, if it takes time, it means that you got KSM involved on the host and then you have a match for your identification. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so the other problem that I realized with this uh, scheme is there is no synchronization primitive that spawn across different VM, right? Well, in reality, there is mechanism out there. IVSHM is just one example, sorry. Uh, but this is not enabled in production environment. IVSHM, you can signal a semaphore across VMs and so on. So, uh, so, it's a, so we, we basically need something to replace the mutex that I was using to signal the server and the client. Why? Well, we want the server to run right after the client. Because if we wait too long, the data that we put in the cache is going to be completely gone. So ideally, we want the, we want the client to run and the server to run right after. If we wait too long, gone. All the data is, is gone. Okay, so there is a couple of options uh, that uh, I thought through. I mean, one of them is, is basically, okay, I'm going to forget all about that synchronization aspect because it looks pretty, pretty complex to solve. And with some error correction uh, set to the roof, uh, I I'm, I'm can probably achieve some, some uh, transmission. So the idea is basically the client and the server, they are floating around 
in their own time space. And after, at some point in time, they will kind of overlap and there will be some transmission. So it will give a very low bit rate, obviously. And also the CPU consumption is going to be low. That, that's good because that's what we want. We don't want to be detected by anyone that is monitoring processes on the system. So we don't want to burn CPU. Option two. So then the other option is basically, well, I'm just going to have a while one loop on the client side, a while one loop on the server side, and I'm just going to adjust the client to run slightly faster than the server. So at some point in time, those guys, they will kind of overlap. And when they do, it's going to provide an OK bit rate. The problem with this implementation is super high uh, CPU utilization. I mean, uh, anybody that monitors the system will detect that there is something wrong going on, right? Uh, so ideally, we would like to stay below 1% of CPU usage. Uh, but I'd say that 1% uh, is still high. With the new technology I'm using, it's like more like 0.1%. OK, option number three is uh, really the, the, the option that I'm using. <clears throat> so this one it is, it basically implies that client and server, they agree on, on a common period, okay, T. And uh, we, we, set up, we set it up so that the client and the server, they lock into phase using a phase lock loop algorithm. So the idea is you have a server, it's in your backdoor VM, it's running, and it sends a sync pattern at regular interval that you have predefined. And then this sync pattern is really like what you find in vertical TV, like vertical sync, for those of you who have seen that before. Um, and now I'm just going to make a deep dive onto that sync pattern because that's new, new stuff I found lately. So remember, we want things to be undetected. So our server that is sending that sync pattern, we don't want that guy to suck CPU, right? We want our sync pattern to be pretty efficient. Ideally, 0.1% would be the, the best thing. But how the client will detect that sync pattern in, in that whole noise and stuff like that is a challenge. So this is where I bring the magic of CL flush. I'm implementing a bidirectional handshake with this one. CL flush instruction is a, it's an x86 instruction it, this thing is normally used to flush a specific cache line so that the other guy that is running on the other side can measure if that cache line is loaded or not so here the idea i had is i'm using cl flush in in a different fashion instead i'm measuring the time it takes to run the CL flush instruction and then if you look, if you think about the microcode this is just pure speculation here, but I mean, it, it, it works with the, with the, the, the model. Uh, the, the microcode of the CL flush instruction, probably the first thing it does is basically, oh, is this page valid? Yes or no? Yes, it is valid. All right, next thing. Is this cache line loaded or not? Yes or no? Well, no, return right away. That's the fast path. Yes, run the eviction algorithm. That's the slow path, okay? So, the time, the, so the trick here for the synchronization that I'm doing, it's basically on the, on the, on the server side, I do CL flush, CL flush, four times, let's say, okay? Four times CL flush. So every time I run that instruction, I expect the time to run that instruction to be small, right? And on the Rx side, what I do is I basically load this cache line, load this cache line, load this cache line, and load this cache line. So I expect that to be fast. The only condition where this thing is not going to hold true is if the two guys are perfectly in sync one on top of the other. Okay? There is no way that the noise on the system can generate such a pattern because the TX is basically running four CL flush instruction in a row spread apart by 200, uh, let's say, cycle. So there is no way that another program out there will access that same cache line and flush it uh, and load it four times in a row. It's almost impossible. Only the Rx side can do that. So that's why it's a pretty efficient sync pattern. OK, so um, like I was saying, uh, so now we have the sync pattern. It's pretty efficient. So the thing that is going on is the client. That's, uh, this is the machine that we control. That's the VM that, that belongs to us. We own that VM. That's the back door on the other side. And so that guy is doing a swap scan 
and basically look at the noise going on. He's seeking for this sync pattern, okay, over and over again. I don't care how much CPU that guys burn. It's my VM. Uh, I control whatever, okay? So when, once the client is basically finding the sync pattern that the server is using, he's basically locking on the phase. And this is where we can do uh, the, our transmission. But the big problem I had, and that's the key aspect uh, to my design, is for that whole thing to work, we have to have a monotonic pulse, okay? It means that really, I mean, like, our two, I don't, the, the server and the, the client, they have to stay kind of in, sh in, in phase. So if you are using a timer, you have to come back always at the same time, so in order to keep the sync. You can tolerate some jitter, but not too much, because remember, all the data that we put in the cache will go out very quickly. So the problem is, how can we achieve a monotonic pulse with Linux, let's say, or Windows? I mean, it, the, 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 the first thing that comes into mind is to use timers. All right, so timers are good because we need to sleep, right? So we can define a period so that over that period of time, we just burn 1% of CPU. But there is a big problem uh, with timers. It's, there is jitters with timers. There is lots of jitters. Uh, this is a frequency distribution graph, uh, log log scale. And <clears throat> as you can see, uh, uh, with timers, there is, there is lots of jitters in the order of 100 microseconds, for example. Actually, to be fair, this, this is pretty good data. I mean, I'm running this test in a VM. Um, and, uh, you know, Linux is running on, on, the, on the gas, in the host, and so on. So I'm really amazed how, how small it is. But <clears throat> for the stuff that we are trying to do here, that's way too much. So on top of this, you have the jitter. I mean, like both client and server, they are subject uh, to the same jitter, right? So it, that's going to be way too much. I mean, they, they're going to go, like, all over the place. <clears throat> So the idea I had is to basically compensate those timer in software using to some value that goes above something I define the maximum uh, jitter. So in theory, this should give us a monotonic, a nice monotonic signal. There is one catch here: is you have to be very careful with with this because the compensation, whatever type of compensation that you do, is subject to noise. So. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is more time you spend trying to immunize yourself to noise, more noise you end up accumulating. So, and, and obviously also, it's the compensation on its own will burn CPU, but that's fine. I mean, all we have to do is to stretch the timer period to something bigger, and then we can compensate into this one. It's a tricky problem. At the end, I got it right. So in short, uh, the compensation algorithm is using a calibrated software loop that is kept in check at every single point in time with the TSC. This is the result I got. Okay, so that's my 2.4 uh, gig machine. And on uh, an idle system, the jitter I have on, on my timers is in the order of 50 cycles. On a loaded system, it goes to 300 cycles. I mean, if you compare that with the stock implementation, the stock implementation was, was giving 240,000 cycle, best case, 24,000 cycle. I mean, that was way, too, way out of bounds. So this 300 cycle, 50 cycle, this is the type, the, the stuff that we need for, to be able to transmit data over cache. So I'm putting the, the data in perspective with the original latency graph here. As you can see, it doesn't even show up on the scale. Um, and as you may already understand, this, this, is the, this synchronization aspect is, is really the key behind this design. Uh, it basically it enables communication to happen, uh, to happen uh, with very low noise, and at the same time, it consumes just a fraction of the CPU. Okay, so now I'm going to recap. Uh, what we have so far. So we have an encoding and a decoding scheme based on memory access time. One is a slow, zero is fast. We managed to get rid of the hardware prefetching logic without fooling around with BIOS. We found some physical cache lines that are shared across VMs, 
thanks to KSM. Now I'm sure some people here are asking themselves, well, what if KSM is not enabled and so on? No worries. I mean, uh, the cache has an associativity level. So if, if we don't use KSM, we can still rely on the cache associativity uh, to do the, the, the encoding. It takes a bit more CPU to do, but I mean, really, I mean, from, from the result I have, it doesn't make a whole bunch of a difference. We have a very efficient way to synchronize the client and the server. We have a phase lock loop that maintains the phase and the inter-VM synchronization less than 120 nanoseconds apart. Okay, all right, that's time. This is now time for a demo. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is, um, let me just look into this one for a second. So this is the, the original um, experiment uh, that I did at the very beginning. At the very beginning, I was using pipeline contention. You remember all the noise that was coming on the other side. It was pretty, pretty ugly. So now with this cache, uh, less level cache modulation, I can achieve much better result. Um, <clears throat> you can see that, uh, I mean, you can obviously see that there is there is noise on the, on the channel, but this is expected. L look, I'm not doing any uh, error correction here uh, whatsoever. So, uh, but the noise level is pretty low, uh, I would say. Then what I did in this video is basically I repeated the streaming experiment. Uh, but this time, um, I, this time it's with this, this uh, cache techniques, okay? So uh, the first thing uh, that I want to mention is, and that's kind of cool, is basically when the transmitter, okay, the transmitter is on the left-hand side. So when the transmitter is not running, the receiver is picking up on whatever is running on the system. He's basically picking up the noise of the underlying system. And to me, uh, this is this is pretty cool. So right now you see like in this picture on the right hand side It's like crappy noisy, uh, but this is because of the um, MP4 encoding software that is running that guy is generating lots of noise if you take this out I should have taken a, a video from my phone um, You see that it's pretty clear the pattern that is coming out of this noise and as a matter of fact if you do um, a frequency analysis of that noise, it basically it gives you a spectral signature um, of the underlying operating system that is running at the host level. So you can find out, assuming you have a database to compare to, who is running on the host with a very, very uh, high level of accuracy. And this is the type of stuff I'm working on these days, and I wanted to pull it for, for today, but uh, unfortunately I haven't, I haven't had a chance. All right, so let's look. Uh, at, at the video, uh, one last thing, there is no compression, no error correction. Uh, it's raw, raw, raw data that is going on. So again, I've got that uh, noise, gener noise generator that is running in the background, the compilation of Linux kernel on the bottom left window. Let's take a look. All right, so you see the noise. So that's the video encoding software that is tr generating so much noise. Now when I start the Linux kernel, you see it becomes white because it, there is so much noise in the cache, all the cache is being evicted all the time. I mean, lots of file access, lots of CPU operation, it's, it's obvious. And now if I start the transmitter, okay, so the transmitter is on the, uh, the left-hand side, you see what is being received on the other side. You see, all, you see that there is noise, and actually this noise is, is triggered by, the, again, by the MP4 encoding software, but if, if you look when I start the compilation of Linux kernel, you see like lots of background noise going on. All right, so let's go back to the slide deck. Thank you. All right, so, from, so if you make the math about the bandwidth here, uh, so this video was transmit VGA quality, one bit per pixel. Um, it was interlaced for time, 15 full frame per second. One frame is, is uh, this quality, one bit per pixel. It, it boils down to roughly 4.5 megabits a second. Both sides are using 50% of a CPU, so I could crank it, I could double that essentially. 
All right. So now it's time to look at something a bit more useful than trying to stream data out. So this is really the reverse shell example I was describing to you guys. Um, so first thing that I'm going here, that I'm doing in, the, in this experiment. So the, the, the two windows, uh, basically, they are like, uh, you know, on the top, they are two, two different VM, obviously. And so the first thing I'm doing is I'm running the server in loopback mode. What does that mean? It means essentially that the server doesn't process the command. He's basically just dumping whatever the client is sending. So client happens to send uh, exadecimal A. So you'll see what's going on here, OK? I'm launching. All right. OK, so the server is running in loopback mode. The client is also running in loopback mode. So the client is, so this is the search for the sync. Then there is a lock, and the client is sending. So now the server receives stuff, but you see that there is crap in, in whatever the server is receiving. That's expected. There is a couple of bits turned on, compilation of Linux kernel, trigger more noise. Again, that's expected. So now I'm, I'm repeating the same experiment, but in, this, uh, in my program, I have uh, what we call forward error correction, ECC. So I'm, I'm turning on ECC dash capital F. And with ECC, things should be corrected, right? So the server is running on the left-hand side. Client, I'm, I'm just going to start the client with forward error correction, enable. And we should see that things are clean, right? It's, yeah, obviously things are clean because uh, it, errors are auto-corrected by the uh, forward error correction, read Solomon. Obviously, if there is more noise than what the error correction can do, uh, the program will display like, you know, star, 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 because it, it basically cannot auto-correct so many bits. I'm just using, um, for parity, I think I'm, I'm using actually just 16-bit. For this one, I'm just using 16-bit ECC for 240-bit payload. So in theory, I, I just could crank this to the roof, and that, that will make it more resilient to, uh, to uh, the noise. So now I'm removing the loop back, and I'm going to run the server in reverse shell mode um, so that the client can execute command on the other side. So when this thing happens, the server is, does not burn CPU. So I'm running command on the right-hand side, and the, the reverse shell on the other side is responding to me. I'm looking at the process that are running on the other VM right now. That's the timing channel, guys, that is running on the other, other VM. He's running the server shell. I can, actually, I'm, I'm going to dump a file right now. That's, the, that's, the, that, that, that's part of the source code for uh, this, uh, this timing channel, one of the file. So yeah, basically, that's the reverse shell that is going on. I'm, doing, I'm just doing exit. The exit is actually is going to exit on the, the server side, obviously. All right, so that was the reverse shell example. Let's go back here to the slide. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now the thing is, what can we do, uh, you know, to avoid that type of stuff, okay? So first thing, disable your KSM, okay? Actually, newer implementation of the kernel, they don't do uh, page DDoP across VMs, so that's fine, per VM policy, essentially. So you get rid of the inter-VM shared page, good stuff. Uh, so your flush and reload won't work, not for free at least. Uh, and then so you, you won't be able to do OS applications uh, fingerprinting, but you will suffer higher memory costs for that. The defense, my, my stuff I'm doing, if someone does that, well, I'll say, okay, forget KSM, we will work at the cache set level instead. Uh, so I don't, I don't need page DDoP. It's a bit more expensive, uh, you, but you have to run a couple of algorithms so to, to find your set, mer merge the set, and, and so on. So you have, typically, you have 16, 16 uh, sets to work with instead of just one. 
So one of the other things that needs to be done, to my opinion, CL flush, I mean, it leaks all over the place. I like measuring the time it takes to do CL flush instruction and deriving data out of that is pretty bad. It's pretty efficient for me, but it's pretty bad for, for system. And for fingerprinting, it's no good. Um, okay, very secure system. You should think about your co-location policy. I was talking to someone um, at lunchtime about that. You know, you have containers, VMs, you're co-located with other uh, vendor, other, other folks, you don't know about them. So if you really want a secure environment, think, think twice about that. I suggest you, you, you basically get the whole box to yourself. There is a couple of things we can do from, from the detection point of view. One of them is uh, we, there is hardware counters that, that exist on the chip. So you can do pattern and noise analysis. I've got some prototype. It's OK, but it sucks CPU on the host. Um, one of the other thing is, is on the host, those process that are run, they are running exactly always at the same time for that to work. So in theory, we can set some heuristic in the kernel to detect those type of scheduling pattern. Abnormal TSC usage is another thing. Uh, read TSC, this, this type of, the, my, my implementation is using lots of read TSC to, to set up the timing and so on. So, I mean, like if there is abnormal TSC usage, red flag. All right, that's all I had, guys. So uh, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>